Yeah, it's it's a it's a problem, isn't it? I mean, I suppose people could realistically, I don't know, but I, I've had emails like this a few times. I'm getting married. I want a 1930s themed wedding. Can you recommend me some stuff? Yeah. Or yeah. you know, 1920s themed or, or whatever, and mm. that could be the springboard. Mm. But mm. I, the, the the one I can't. Yeah, I always illustrate, if I'm trying to talk to someone about how collecting has changed, most operatic records now, you just can't shift. Mm, Things mm. that would have been perfectly sellable 20 years ago. Stephen, the EMG colonel, had a gobsmacking collection of operatic I I, I must have mm, two shelves mm. of Fonda Um, You know... The amount of G and T and Grand Monarch and stuff involved is is it's more than I've ever seen in my life, and it, all the sales that you see, if you look on Pop Psych and things, the prices for the, for the things that have actually sold over the years have gone down and down and down and down and down, and yeah. I don't think that's ever going to come back as a as a collectible. type of 78 um, mm. yet mm. the less common Jack Hilton and Savoy Orpheans discs are going through a little bit of a heyday yeah I've Isn't kind it? of got a, a couple of couple of ideas about this um, the the opera thing and probably few other types of music as well is literally because there's uh, it's the same people bidding on them year on year and each year there's less <laughs> there's less people and there's no new recruits because what you kind of yeah. got to look at is if you, if you look at just society in general uh, this will end up happening with the jack hiltons and things as there's less and less people in in different ways or people who don't need to upgrade anything anymore and stuff like that is that like if you look at just when any given all the collectors that are listening to this could think in the same way is just look at society in general and the different age groups and the different interests or lack of interest in things people have and what they spend their time on. Can you imagine that successive numbers of people like they did in the past would get into collecting these things? Because obviously, like, mm. 50 plus years ago, um, more people would have read than they do now. I know there's Kindles and stuff that you can read yeah. on, but, like, it, there, there was there was, like... Just to me, there seems to be kind of like it, it's not instantly gratifying enough collecting records for people now. They want a result. They want to to ping on their phone straight away, or they want to listen to something at the click of a button, or be involved in something like straight away, and then drift into something else later on. They don't. They don't want a, a lifetime hobby that they're going to have to graft for. That's yeah, just, that's it, interesting. Yeah, it's a, so. It's a, you don't think going on Facebook and going on to one of the rare 78 groups and posting, oh, look, I just got there, blah, 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 is going to provide that need? That would, to an extent, but then you've got to think, is that, is, 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 is that kind of, is that not just a different version of what they already do? It's like... Well, it's, it's, it's again, it's the uber rare being the only thing that matters, again. You know, we keep coming back to this same thing where people are literally not going to give a toss about your average, I don't know, Leighton and Johnson Columbia, and that's the stuff that will all go in the skip, no matter how good it is, because mm. people won't get to hear it. And some and of that, those records true. are iconic yeah. 20s records, I would say. Mm. And I suppose it, it's true of, true of other other styles as well because you could you get these records where um sort of drifting into vinyl again but mm. also uh, the, the, the stuff did come out on 78 you can have a rare instrumental record fetch a fortune but actually a champs record is better but it's only worth a few quid yeah so it's you know <laughs> to be fair the champs are actually, better than most things <laughs> yeah yeah but uh but like yeah, kind of rarity takes over with things, and I think particularly with the rare blue stuff. I mean, there's some fun. You've kind of got to differentiate like good music from rarity because there's yeah. some fantastic rare blues records that when if you were to when you listen to them, they're in 
you get whatever you get from it, whether yeah. you call it enjoyment yeah. or what, just like you would from anything else. Yeah, I mean, Robert Johnson is, you know, he's going to say yeah. he's rubbish, you know. No, because he's not. It's just, it's just in the same way that lots of other artists of other styles aren't rubbish for whatever reason. But there's some awful, expensive blues records. Yeah, yeah. And there's some, uh, there's some off, there's some naff or run of the mill sounding jazz records that fetch a lot of money because it's on a rare label or it's, uh, you know, it didn't sell well or so. And well, it might not have sold for a reason because it's naff. <laughs> it seems yeah. to be missing in some people's minds that I think and yet um, it's, it's, the original Dixieland jazz band Victors are still out there for collectors to get for, for what they are for peanuts yeah because they're excellent they're excellent examples of what that is yeah, um, yeah. And, and they sold fortunately and that, this, this is actually quite a good thing in collectors some things that are really good sold well and they're not just an entry point because you you could play that rec- you could play an original Dixieland jazz band record as a youngster or today or in fifty years time and enjoy it. It doesn't yeah. lose the yeah. enjoyment just because oh I've heard this before. Well, you'll happily hear it again. Yeah, because so, it's phenomenal and it's historic yeah. and it, it ticks all the boxes and yet it's not worth anything really. Yeah, they're, they're, they're worth minimal. Uh, I think there was a time. Maybe they were fifteen twenty quid, maybe, but. We're not yeah, talking. So I guess some of them. I hadn't thought. I hadn't really thought about what they are worth, to be honest. But certainly, from for to some of the um, American collectors listening, I suppose if you if you are very active and you live in an area where seventy eights are still plentiful, because there seems to be some areas of the USA where seventy eights don't seem to turn up as often, then you won't think that. I mean, the original Dixieland jazz band might be things that you can pick up like at estate sales and junk junk shops yeah. and things even now i guess uh or swap them with other collectors so they might actually think yeah the music's good but they have even less value than we think they have i just thought um, of something as well which i think is going to be make a big difference going forward what yeah. percentage of the stuff that we're talking about here and is, and is collectible is american and what percentage um, of it is british because I'm thinking here of Al Bowley, and I'm struggling to think of any other British artist who has that kind of collector's appeal. Or that fetch the bigger... The, yeah, the ones the, that do the fetch the bigger stuff. prices. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I think you're right, and I think there is, for example, in the States, you do get buyers, and there'll probably be people mm. eventually listen to this that, that, that fit this category or know somebody who does. They're Americans that buy, say, British dance bands, and they got into it because it's something different in the same yeah. way that I'm British and I like American music, as well as liking lots of other things. Yeah. I like American music because I, I can't get it here. Or when it yeah, came out yeah. over here, it, it was something special for me to find. But I think, yeah, yeah, I think most of the music that seems to fetch money, even outside of 78, is American. Well, I'm just thinking, in, in 50 years' time, is your average collector's proper hardcore record collector shelves just going to be full of Paramounts and Genets? Even in, in northern England or somewhere like that? And yeah, there will yeah, be yeah. nary a broadcast or an Eclipse or a Rex mm. in sight. Yeah. And if they're not Paramounts, they're going to be 50s king label records yeah. or federals or what you know these these types of things which is fine because yeah. they're great but it's but it's yeah, transformed it's, everything hasn't it the internet mm, it's absolutely mm. but it's the same with it, it's the same with uh, if you take sort of rock and roll as an example i mean it, it obviously it's an american form of music but very very few british things even better what obviously with the exception of the really good ones like vince taylor and st- or, or uh, you know um th- things of that ilk very few fetch any money. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's 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 all. It, it, I mean, you'll find from things from other countries like New Zealand, Australia, Canada, um, of the later rock and roll and rockabilly seventy eights will fetch money, but British equivalents won't. So that um, you know, and you could probably say the same for because mm. obviously there's European rock and roll. Um, they're the same, unless. I mean, it was a factor to that of how many Tommy Hill records does one need to have? I mean. Um, well, yes, there is that. You know. <laughs> um, and there's a, there's, a, there's a lot more sort of combo rock and roll things from Britain, like Tony Crombie. Oh, yeah, and Bar- Teach You to Rock and all that. Yeah, all that sort of stuff. But, yeah, so there's not actually that much sort of small-scale 
uh, Gene Vincentish rock and roll from Britain. There's odd one. Yeah. Um, and I mean, there's Vince do... Taylor, and they go for mega money. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then, but, so I suppose there is an amount thing here, like the actual amount, like the amount of records that fit a certain description. But yeah, definitely, I think there's a a huge focus on American music. But there yeah. again, if you it, it, like, everything came out in America more or less. Because yeah, even yeah. if it didn't. It, it, even if you sort of think of like people bringing records over to the States with them when they moved there from all over the world, then you got your big record labels like Columbia and so on had to start issuing um, uh, Polish music, ethnic German series, music. And yeah, they had their own ethnic series and then it went from there. People, you know, well, right through the uh, 78 era, you had uh, entire labels set up for polka music or... Um, uh, various other styles of oh, music yeah. that came from different parts of the world originally. So yeah, I think you can if if you either live in America or have access to American seventy eight, you can hear more or less everything you would want to to hear without having to yeah. come into contact with Tommy yeah. Steele. So well, we, and, and you'd hear it all <laughs> without having to come into contact with a seventy eight, which is another thing that I think it's worth pointing out here. British recordings are woefully unrepresented on reissues. I mean, yes, yeah. they just aren't yeah. there. If you wanted mm. to hear a particular Reginald Dixon record, which is common and cheap as chips, you just wouldn't find it. On, on a reissue? On on oh. anything on YouTube, on oh, a reissue. Right. On, right. You right. know what I mean? Like, it's not mm. accessible unless you have the disc in your hand, and that is becoming very different for Americans because of things like the National Jukebox and things that, you know, like all the victors of, you know, uh, the original Dixieland Jazz Band, you can hear, and mm. you can hear most Billy Murray and, you know, things like that that will turn yeah. off in yeah. there. Mm. Um, and it just isn't the case here. So I think in this country, collecting is going to... Th I think in 50 years, British 78s will be kind of rare. Yeah. You know and what I, I mean? But then, but then you've got the whole thing of, like, yes, rare, but wanted... No, maybe, maybe not. Maybe not so much. No. And, and you could say, yeah, I suppose if on these websites and these other resources and, and even sort of CD reissues, you can get, like, for example a 40s American band leader, regardless of how obscure or not, could be represented. But you won't find a mid-40s Oscar Rabin no. issue. <laughs> uh, Which is... Or, 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 you know, or, or a, a, a late 40s, sort of post-Rust discography era, late 40s Geraldo recordings on a reissue. It's just, yeah. there's lots of things... Either, there's lots of things missing that, but then you've got to think like the people who would want those things would probably collect 78s anyway. So, yeah. Uh, and I think as well, collectors automatically, and after this, I, I thought, ah, oh, it's just a Billy Cotton Rex, or oh, whatever, mm, you know. Mm. And a friend of mine collects, um, things like that, late, late 40s dance bands. He really likes them. Mm, and he said, mm. Have you ever tried finding the same Billy Cotton Rex twice? Uh, yeah, yeah, good point. <laughs> and I'll yeah, tell you what, yeah. now that I've thought about it, it's never happened. Mm. Just the earlier ones, yeah, but the, the later Red Label 40s ones, no. And how much of that do you think is due to collectors just going, that's a late Billy Cotton Rex, don't want it, without having... Yeah, so that... Yeah, they, they probably never ended up in people's collections, like po like after the era itself. You know, people buying them second hand, um, so they just got slung out when people got rid of them who owned them to start with. Um, yeah. uh, and I think they're the first things, like you say, that it, even if you've got someone who says, "Ah, I collect British dance bands," regardless of where they live or how much they've got to spend or whatever, that they're the first things that people disregard. The later ones. Mm. Uh, or the things that are like, oh, well, that's a really famous band, and it, it's not an early one, so I won't bother. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That, that must happen a lot, and there'll be entire band leaders that that that. Uh, yeah, Harry, Harry Leader, and things like that. Um, yeah, yeah, that'll be re basically rejected by collectors, um, either because they've always rejected them, and younger ones that have access to hearing 
Arthur Rosebery and things on uh, YouTube won't, <laughs> wouldn't consider doing it anyway. And I've never uh, found an Arthur. No, I found one Arthur Rosebery in the wild. It was a friend who moved into a house. There was some 70 in the loft and there was a Rosebery in there. I'd never found one before. Right. Yeah, I, think I found a couple of his in the wild, sterno ones, but I never saw, I never saw them. But I've, I've had the parts, a few of the parlophones over the years, mm. but not from not from the wild, no way. Yeah, you see, this was, uh, a, this was a parlophone, and it was the only one I'd ever seen. It was uh, sitting in the cold, wet grass was one side of it. I don't know. What the oh, yeah, was. yeah. But, mm. um, yeah, I think the globalisation of of collecting is really interesting because I bet there are some American collectors who have better collections of British dance bands than most British collectors. In fact, I know yeah. there are. I'm thinking of one particular guy who mm. has an incredible collection of British rarities. Yeah. Uh, and that's what it'll be as well. It'll be, um, it'll be the British, the, the rarities and with occasional exception, they'll have had to have really paid for them as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So it, again, it's that's not good or bad. It's just that it just is, and yeah. um, it's a totally different way of collecting things because obviously you are detached um, yeah. location-wise from where you could. But, but but there again, they probably have things that we would we wouldn't find just looking for stuff because they yeah. just they are so rare. So there is that. Um, what kinds of genres do you think are really? underrated by collectors is, is there stuff that you think's really good that no one else seems to have picked up on um probably probably the kind of 78s that you would say you liked and i've always liked them but i haven't always had the space to own huge numbers but i did used to pick them up like things like robert radford and um oh, yeah. a, a lot of those um types of singers from Ballad the singers. Yeah, from the earlier part of the the twentieth century, sort of uh, who who obviously sold records well into the twenties and so, um, and their records were available for a long time. Obviously, Peter Dawson is probably the most famous, yeah, um, of that stable. But um, I think that they get disregarded, and it, it the quality of the music and the quality of the singing and. Um, the, the songwriting or the history of the folk songs that become another song and all that type of thing that these records are connected with is just totally disregarded. Yeah, um, yeah it's true. About, unless you get, unless you get in jet with perhaps me and yourself as an exception, most people who like that type of thing, which is a low number of people anyway, that's what they're into. And they don't like jazz. They don't like, big bands I've like met rock other people who like it I mean I've met I have a friend Alan who who, who really likes that stuff um, but he mm. likes other stuff as well um, and right, right. And I I've think just, he's the only I person I think he's the only person I've ever met who gives a toss about him in the first place you know right right I don't think um, I've met there was a guy years ago who collected Dawson specifically but he didn't collect any any other artists. It was just Peter Dawson. Right. And that was, right. you know, that was the only thing that he wanted. But again, you know, the, the floral dance was, at one point, everywhere. I mean, I, I, I kept finding one record and none of his others. And I don't know if that's the right, case where I you were. To... I used to find, um, cer not particularly that one, but I used to find certain ones of his more often than others. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it was only quite a bit later that these other, th that if if the title didn't stand out to me, it was like, oh, I'm going to buy that because I don't, I don't know this one. I, I came across a one of his, I think it was, it just called Cider. One, <laughs> one of his, yeah, his. that's, yeah, slightly. That was, that was much much later on. You you find things like that, but before that, it was just like my sword and I. I travelled yeah, the road. Yeah, the, the 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 usual, which there is nothing wrong with them at all in any way, shape, or form. But they were just the ones. It was just the same mm. titles that cropped up because they must have sold in huge, not only in huge quantities, but over a long period of time as well. Because yeah. you see them on all the different. HMV label styles going to you know even well into the fifties just the label you think oh yeah that's um, that's like a twenties record or an yeah. early thirties record or something. 
So yeah, so that's that. That's the one that sticks out and probably which should be more popular because it should be very accessible. It's like his music hall. You would think that, that oh, would be yeah, bigger than it is. Yeah, you see, that's another thing. A bit like opera that used to be very collectible. Mm. And mm. it isn't, and I think that's just, that's entirely generational, isn't it? That's people who will have seen Vesta Tilly and collected mm. records of celebrities, and people now don't know who they are, so they don't collect them and they don't care. Yeah, because I suppose if people were buying what were classed at the time as being old records in the 50s and 60s when 78s were sort of on the way out or out, mm. um, and they could go into junk shops and things, um they grew up in an era and were still in an era uh, where things like Max Miller was normal and like kind of uh, the musical tradition was on the TV, the radio. It was like still a standard format. And a yeah. lot of the songs that were sang in the early 1900s were still like any old Iron Peter Sellers did that. So these in the 50s. So these things were still around. And um, people would collect autographs, people would collect records of these things, and, and they would become historic record yeah. collectors or custodians, and they would see it as like, oh, this is part of our history. But yeah, as you say, if, if people um, if people don't go further back than EastEnders, then they don't know who these people are. They're I think just, the problem don't. with musical going forward is going to be some of the references are going to become obscure. So, yeah, because the, the the references in in the lyrics and the titles and things relate to things that people don't know about now. Yeah. Whether it's um, the 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 um, uh, imperial currency, or it might be yeah. um, you know any anything like that that you, we just take as oh sixpence this or uh, this this type of clothing or you know someone talking about galoshes or it, that's that's just a word to us, but to some people it'd be like well, what does that mean? Yeah, it's like it, it yeah. won't mean anything to them because it's just it's so far removed. So yeah, I think it, when you said generational, that that kind of hits it really. I think yeah, um, some musical songs could become a bit like the Charleston, though. They will become. It's a long way to Tipperary. I'm thinking of and and things like that. Maybe even Hello, Hello, Who's Your Lady Friend? Um, mm. there, there, I think in in years to come, there will be some songs that have been said. This is the song that everyone was singing. So that will become an iconic song, and suddenly records of it will mm. become mm. collectible, a bit like the Charleston is. But yeah. I think um, the rest of it is just going to... No one's going to understand. And as well, re Music Hall had a lot of regional act going on, and they might also become quite difficult for people to understand I, mean, I remember my first tom foy record and i'm from york and tom foy was from yorkshire i had to get mm. to a friend of my granddad's in to translate because i had no yeah, idea think, what he was on about yeah i think that's because, because um in if you just take yorkshire as an example and then you take say leeds as an example you'd have had lots of leeds accents you yeah. wouldn't have had a lead you wouldn't have had one uh, whereas now Leeds, uh, any kind of Leeds, there will be Leeds accents, but you'll get a lot of people living in Leeds that aren't from, that, that even if they're from somewhere else in England originally mm. and they've moved there for work, they're from, they're, they're from a different part of Yorkshire or they're from the Midlands and accents all get sort of, you know, mixed mixed together, whereas back then you would have had even sort of like small numbers of streets would have their own dialects and things and because uh, yeah. people lived near their workplace and stuff and, and terminologies would vary. Um, so even though it, Tom Foy is Yorkshire, um, it's different it to your broad, part of Yorkshire yeah. and, it's, and it's also a, a different again because of how far back it goes. Um, yeah. But yeah, I remember first hearing those ones of his, and I thought I can kind of get some gist out of this. But uh, yeah, a lot of it's lost, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Did you used to find music or records where you where you looked? Yeah, um, interesting that you brought up Tom Foy because they were they were the most usual ones of of, of the because uh, they weren't they were available for quite a long time, especially like the Zonophones. Yeah, I've had one of them on the thirties Zonophone. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think that um, I think 
I think they were the easiest ones to find. Uh, it meant that, but having said that, once you had two or three, it was like, do you need any more? Yeah. <laughs> if, if it's not your, yeah. totally your thing and your only thing, you probably thought, well, actually, I'm quite happy to have two or three. And no I, more. I, I don't have any of his. Um, right. I find him annoying. Right. <laughs> and and um, there's an archive in Clivero that mm. actually want his records, so they got mine. Um, and and they were interesting because they now here here's something to to ponder over. I suppose could music hall be fall into the bubble of ethnic in fifty years? In yeah, the, I would think, but very possibly, yeah. Now, now, that's an interesting thing to think about, isn't it? All these mm. Tom Foy records are suddenly going to be collected by the people who collect ethnic records from, I don't know, Taiwan and India. Mm. Mm. Because they represent a culture that's now gone. They, they re represent a, a, a people's culture. So it is like yeah. folk music, isn't it? It's not It's not like listening to a, a Horse Guards band record. Yeah, I've never thought of that. I've never thought no, of that they're, they're not now. they're not royalty based or um, um, elite based. They're people's. They were they were by and for the the masses, um, and, and mm. they were performed in in such a way that uh, yeah, that it was it was music for the cheap seats, wasn't it? It was, uh, um, and it's absorbed. It absorbs all of those aspects. Yeah, and then. It's it's gone, and that way of life has gone as well, which is good and bad. There's good, there's yeah. good and bad sides to that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I I I used to find a lot of Tom Foy. I used to find a few George Formby Senior. I couldn't stop finding George Formby Junior, which is interesting because the EMG Colonel again was collecting mm. in Oxford. He mm. never saw the Formby record. Not a I single can, one in the world. I can kind of believe that yeah. because he, he was just so popular in the north of England, not just yeah. in the particular part of. I mean, he would he would have been able to travel anywhere and perform and be successful. Obviously, he was success. had successful films as well as records. Um, yeah. But um, I can believe that, like, it, to someone in Oxford, regardless of anything, uh, it, it just doesn't mean it doesn't mean the same thing, does it? It's not. No. Uh, the re the references and the the, the accent and it's just it's kind of it's not needed is it it's just the buy, buy something else instead and then you get so, the opposite end of the scale where I didn't mm. find a Billy Williams record for a long time ah uh, now I used to I I used to find his a lot including on mm. labels where I used to find like um, I had a one on Ariel yeah. um, quite early on and I used to find them on. Um, Oh, he was on a tower record of his at one point. He was he was mm. on everything, but I used to get quite a lot of different ones. I didn't used to just find no, them that regal or just tower find record one. must have had an interest in history because they weren't sold local to you at all. No, I wonder where how that ended up. Uh, yeah, they, they were they not? I uh, can't remember exactly, but I think they were some department store label. Yeah, but for the, the London department. Yeah, 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 yeah. John Ball. I used to find a lot of John Ball. Um, not when I first started, but when I started getting a bit obsessive and, and putting adverts in newspapers. Mm. Um, it was quite a lot of John Ball records, a lot of, uh, quite a few Phoenix, always of military bands. Um, Cinch. Yeah, Cinch used to turn up quite a lot where where, where I live, but the I've never had a Phoenix. bad Cinch. I've never um, had a bad record on that label. I've never had a, a hymn on it or a church organ or anything like that. It's oh, always been good stuff. They, they, they do, those used to turn off occasionally, um, but but they were mainly interesting. Yeah, and yeah. The, and the, Fe the Phoenix ones, um, I don't think I ever had a military band unless it was like a ragtime thing. Yeah, most uh, of mine were ragtimey. They, they were my first ragtimey records, really, and Phoenixes and Cinches. Um, so obviously we're we're talking because we're from slightly different regions of the north of England, mm. but mm. Stephen, who's my reference really for the for South England, said he used to come across a lot of early Zonophones and and Columbia Arena. I never found them. No, I never used to find those very uh, Zonophones. 
Occasionally, I'd find us on the phone. Well, Tom Foy, obviously, mm. was on him, and and Formby, and and there were a few of. I used to find some. I know they were regal. I used to find a lot of Alexander Prince regals, concertina stuff. I didn't used to. I used to occasionally find those, but the, the on labels like Rena and things like that, oh. and on other labels, I used to, I used to find. Um, Peter Wiper records quite a lot, like the uh, the accordion mm, music. Yeah, 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 yeah. A lot they of used those to turn like up here. Scottish reels and stuff, and obviously I'm not that far from Scotland. So. Yeah, they used to turn up here a little bit. Um, my first single side of Columbia was one of his, actually. Right. I never used to... I, I don't think I... didn't used to find... I used to find single sided things tended to be 12-inch records when I found them. Oh, that's Particularly completely the, the opposite to me. Right. That's interesting, Matt, because I... Did he ever find a Caruso or anything like that? Um... In the wild? Not locally. No, no, me either. Me Unless either. there were the later ones with the redubbed orchestra on and things. I, I never found them even. Oh, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, I did find the, the DB in... series stuff sometimes. But... Ah, right, right. No, I used to find them when I used to go to other places, but I didn't yeah. used to find them locally but the the 12 inch uh, i used to find that like you used to find 12 inch records that were like what would you call them like like blatant 12 inch things like they would be really early gramophone concert record or mono mm. record type things the the black and gold label things and it would be like um uh like a like different figures of lancers and things like that it was uh, yeah you know, like, Things that could only really be a 12-inch record. Yeah, the um, ifs orchestra type stuff. Yeah, yeah, I used to find quite a bit of stuff like that, but... but um, oh, I never did. But you didn't find that type of music very often on 10-inch rods, and you didn't find late much of that type of thing on later records either. It was almost like mm. if you bought records then, like pre-1910, you, you didn't really have access to that many different labels. Uh, you bought that type of stuff. I think that's kind of what yeah. it must have been. Um, yeah, uh, we we I I never found twelve inch um, early twelve inch records. In fact, I remember my first early twelve inch record. It was um, got old Clara Butt again doing Three Fishers Went Sailing. I think nineteen ten or eleven ish, and I was absolutely mm. over the moon <laughs> at finding it. Um, mm. And it was a real first for me. The real first for me where I got a decent number of 12-inch records that were actually of interest to me, and I still have some of them now, um, is when I found, I think there was four albums of 12-inch records that were like non-classical, sort of yeah. Mayfair, Orchestra, Mayfair Dance Orchestra, um, oh, yeah. Paul White, Paul Mightman, 12-inch HMVs. Um, Joseph C. Smith, things like that. Yeah, Joseph C. Smith, but there was also like one that was mainly Columbia, so that was stuff like... Um, oh, London the good old Dance London, da yeah. yeah They're well, best of my favourite records. I think I was about 14 when I found these, and there was four of those, and then I think he had four or five... This was at the flea market again, but somebody different selling them. And there were four or five... Um, Kind of like Robert Radford sort of stuff and thought mm. bits things that that sort of style. So almost like to, it, they came from the, they'd obviously come from the same place, but it was like music that they probably played when people came round was like the dance records, and then they played the other stuff when it was just the the owner at home listening to music. That's kind of how the collection came across to me. And the earliest records were from sort of towards the end of the First World War. And the latest ones were probably from only about four years later. It was a really wow. strict time period. Yeah. And I think I got the whole. I think I got the whole lot for like two quid or something. He just wanted. Oh, to I love things like that. <laughs> yeah, that was. It. Days <laughs> of the I days. Think he, was, he was going to charge me two quid for the ones I wanted, and then he said, "Will you just take?" And I couldn't actually carry them home. I couldn't. I couldn't. I had to do to, to, I had to go back and pick the other ones up. People forget how um, flipping heavy the twelve-inch albums are. Yeah, yeah, and I think yeah, when you're thirteen or fourteen, and you've only got the mm. you've you've all um, I, I think did I I don't think that was the occasion I walked with with them. I think I did I did have my bus fare left, but uh, yeah, it was. 
Yeah, people forget about <laughs> things like that when someone says, oh, just have these, and you think, yeah, I've got to get them home, though. Uh, yeah, yeah, I had an experience like that where um, I had an advert in the newspaper, I'm looking for 78s, and a guy contacted me, his aunt was a piano teacher, and she had all these binders of what turned out to be very good uh, mm. piano records, which is a chuffing good job for they were good, because I, <laughs> they were on a fourth floor flat, and the right. list didn't work, so... Lovely. Oh, there, there were probably 80 albums full. Wow. <laughs> so me and my mum getting them downstairs, I, she probably still has that, um, getting them out of there, that was horrendous. But that was the first time I came across classical records in bulk here. Mm. It, I, mm. The north of England just didn't seem to sell them. Yeah, the first time I ever got one, and I really enjoyed it when I got it home, I think I bought two on the same day. There was a um, revolutionary study by Irene Shira. Oh, yeah. Uh, early 30s Columbia, Columbia yeah. DX series, but it was a later pressing. It was a, like a 40s or early 50s pressing. And then there was an early 50s uh, Lewis Kentner Chopin record again a DX mm. Columbia um, and I got that because this this stood out from what else was there and I thought oh they might be quite nice uh, and um, still have them and I, I know you and, collect yeah. piano records yeah I think that, that might have been why I bought them because they weren't or I mean I did buy orchestral things occasionally and different things but uh, I because um, I had Ina Klein at Mac Music on uh, Polydor which was a German pressing yeah, on Polydor. That, 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 that was, uh, I seem to think that was an early electric recording. Nice. I can't remember who conducts it, but that came from the flea market. But I tended, because there were so many 78s to look through and so little money, I tended not to buy classical 78s, but the piano yeah. stuff I always, and they were super clean, and I thought, I can't not buy these. Um, and I've still got them now, and I've always liked uh, anything piano-related has always interested yeah. me. But they were, they, it was almost like, I think when I got them home and played them, I almost felt like it was something, because they were bigger records and they were kind of, you know, something a bit different. Probably felt like as if I bought them new and was just getting into it because they, 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 you could tell why these things were expensive when they were new yes. because they were such nice things. Yes. Um uh, and I did actually know the revolutionary study piece of music. I had it on an LP or something by someone else. Yeah. And I thought, oh, I'd like to have that on a 78. So it was like, yeah, I did used to pick things. Whereas like now and more recently, I would buy, I mean, if I had an opportunity to buy a, a modest size collection at a, a decent price of that sort of stuff, I would just buy it. If you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, whereas then it was like, oh, I've just got to kind of pick through things. Um but yeah, yeah. There's there's, yeah. there's things that aren't really me, aren't anything like main focus that I still really like, um, and and that's a good example. Yeah, I I feel that way about um, Albert Sandler and things like that. I really like Albert mm. Sandler. Um, I think I have almost all of his ten inch Columbias from from one place. Um, right, right. Um, about hundred and twenty of them. His stuff used to turn up quite often, and they used to. Um, Trying to think of a, um, it used to occasionally get things like, um, I remember getting some like Ave Maria and it was, um, Patricia Rosper playing it, which is not really what you'd think of yeah, her doing. Yeah, yeah. But it also had an organ on the same record. You used mm. to get things like that quite, quite often. And, um, the only time I ever really saw parlophones were 12 inch 20s and 30s ones where it was like the Dresden oh, the Opera or Awful Oscar Children's or Choir of. Trappenberg or that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. But you used to get some better classical things, but they get certain labels only used to turn up certain styles of music. Yeah, uh, yeah. That was that was very much the same here actually. Twelve inch records. So you'd. I never. I always found like part sets of symphonies that used to do my head in because yeah, I really liked symphonic music. Mm -hmm. I remember the first album set that I ever got was. And I bought it basically because it was complete and it had its album and it was a quid. I didn't buy it for any other reason. I didn't buy it thinking, wow, I can't wait to hear this. It mm -hmm. was Haydn's Clock Symphony um, with the, the Toscanini one from like 26. 
six or seven. Mm. And it sat there unplayed for ages. When I eventually played it, I couldn't stop playing it. I played it for a week. I played it five times. Mm. You know? Mm. And mm. that was the influence on me. But again, you have to be able to store things, keep things, and get things first hand, so to speak, to have the experience of realising, oh, actually, I like this. Yeah, I had, a, I had a collection of stuff like that from that same flea market. Normally, I used to just buy things you could kind of carry away with you there and then. But shortly after I got a car, so I was sort of like 18-ish. You're like, wow, I can um, store things. I can do other, yeah, I can, I can sort of uh, cut things around. And he had this, um, I was looking through a box of records that had all, obviously all come from the same place, uh, singular records, and there's quite a few Jack Hiltons and including one that I haven't seen many, uh, was it uh, something like Little Boy Blue or something like that, I think it was. can't remember the title now, but mm. it's, it, it, it's not what it's not one you see very it's often. It's not one anyway. I've had. And, there was, um, and they all had the same person's handwriting of a reference number in fountain pen in the corner of the sleeves. It was, they were, it was a collection from the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the, the, they looked like they'd been barely played. I thought, oh, I've, I've, I've hit the jackpot here. And uh, I pulled out a reasonable number of records. And the guy came over and said, oh, there's some, there's some more here, but they're albums. And some of the albums were kind of more of the same stuff, that albums that had been put together. Um, and then other ones were things like your um, symphony example. In fact, I think that was in, I think that was one of them. And he was like, do, "Do you want to buy them all?" And uh, I kind of didn't, kind of didn't want to. Yeah. And I left it till the following week and went back. And he said, "Oh, I can do the lot for this much." And I thought it was a, it was a good deal. And um, bought everything, and there were loads of um, classical orchestral and chamber music albums. And uh, I'd, I'd, I had somewhere to put them intermittently, but I didn't have anywhere really to store them. Yeah. Um. And they did end up going to somebody who, who was, uh, I can't remember where they went, but they, they, they didn't get dumped. You know, they went to somebody who was going to who was gonna uh, appreciate them because I think he took some LPs off us as well. But now, if that was now, I would actually pay to store those if I needed to and I would have kept them probably. Yeah, you see. Because um, they were like new. They were looking, yeah. And there was, lo there was absolutely loads of these sets and I don't even think there was a broken record amongst mm. them. They were just, they were all, re I mean, so they weren't, you know, I didn't keep them, but at least yeah, they got some use yeah, somewhere else. Yeah. But, but I would definitely have, uh, I would have definitely hung on Did to them now. Have, and they were so yeah. cheap. Did you ever have an uh, old shop stock experience? I, I mean, I, um, that, I, I did. That's once. probably the, I, I actually think maybe the albums were old stock, actually. Mm. Those, I, I, I think the if the spines were perfect, it must have been. Yeah, they, they were. They were exceptional condition. I think actually the the person who might have owned those records who had who had actually written their own reference numbers on the 10 inch records might have actually worked in a record shop oh. i think that might mm. you know when you get a yeah. certain vibe off a collection yeah you get a feeling the story really. was. I, I think that's probably the closest i've come to to sort of store stock stuff um well non 50s store stock i've come across um things that I've seen store stock from the 50s that have all had salvage stamped on the labels, which I thought was interesting. I've seen that a yeah. few times. Yeah. Um, I don't know what that what that, what that was to. for. Yeah, salvage, as in these were saved. They were. Yeah, it was kind of like not a, an ink stamp, kind of like um, almost like an an etched thing in the label but it doesn't tear the label mm. it's a weird uh, it, it probably more it, more of like a, um if you felt it you'd you'd, you'd know what i meant um yeah, if, you ever, yeah. if you ever got one um and i've actually seen multiple copies of 16 tons by ernie ford with that on from different places so I'd, whether it mm. was like a, a way of getting rid of stock where they just pressed too many that Awesome that thing, 16 tons used to be my favourite record when I was about four. Yeah, and, it, is a, it is a good record. It's a great record. And um, that was one of the things that sent me on the 78 to Rabbit Hole in the first place, actually. Mm, mm. But I think I think those two things, that perhaps finding some 50s things occasionally that looked as if they were 
store stock uh, without actually knowing for certain with the salvage stamp on and those earlier things with the albums they're probably the only store stock 78 experiences yeah, i've had yeah yeah i mean you've you've heard mine i think um the, the mm, famous mm. sheffield um bookshop where i I walked in there and said, have you got any 78s? And, and his response was, no, actually, I'll look here. Because um, basically they'd, they'd built over an old shop. and mm. just, But that's for another time. I have to find someone to interview me about it. Yeah, but, that's um, it. yeah as you interview more people, you'll you'll probably realise like what questions mm. uh, to ask other people, but then also which ones you'd want to be asked yourself. And, and uh, yeah. Then when it's your turn, you kind of, it's... I think it's stood out some more interviews. about yeah. that shop. I wonder if there was a regional policy of how much of some stuff to stock. You know, from the big mm. companies, HMV Columbia. Mm. Mm. Because there were 12-inch records in that shop stock, mm. but there were no sets and there were no classical stuff. It was the twelve inch records there were were Harry Davidson Columbia's and um, right. there were a few things like bits of the Messiah, you know, not not part sets but people having recorded um and he shall feed his flock and things like that, you know. Yeah, the more famous stuff. pieces from it. Mm. But there were no symphonies, no chamber music, no um no concertos. And I do wonder if these bigger companies had regional policies where say they'd send 200 copies of a mozart concerto to some place in leeds and 700 to a place in london yeah it could have been that or also if it was only quite a small shop that was was that a, was it originally a book shop that had a record section is that no it was originally a record shop that had been mm. built over by the owners to to house a bookshop it had just been built over because they wanted to use this other floor and the, mm. the, the bit that the record shop originally was they were sort of using for some storage they'd kept all mm. the original record shop shelving intact mm. well, that's good. and there were loads of packing boxes um, like HMV mm. packing boxes and mm. things like that in fact there were some records um I need another copy of um, what's that called? Clar Clarinade by Benny Goodman on Parlophone. Um, there was a box of twenty right. copies of it. Um, there was a box of twenty copies of some Sinatra record or one. All or nothing. At all. No, not all or nothing at all. That was his first one. Um, so that that tells me that it was literally just unsold stock. Um, yeah, I think you might have, in that instance, when you say about things like the, um, uh, the Davidson 12-inch Columbias and things, they would probably have got quite a lot of copies of those in stock yeah, anyway yeah. because they were popular, and you've actually just ended up with what was left. Yeah, um, that'll be it, yeah. And, uh, plus, if, if somebody w did go in there, because uh, was it a large shop or was it quite small? I'm guessing it was well, really small. Well, there were 3,500-ish records that I got from there and that will have been the remains of their old sock I suppose so it must have been smallish most yeah, of it was I've, I've seen I've seen sleeves where people the the shop says that we st we we can obtain all the things from these yeah. labels catalogues and we have a hundred thousand records in stock as well as being able to order things so i think your shop might have been one where they ordered in in advance what they thought would be popular yeah um, yeah you got what was left and then if somebody wanted something they didn't have you just have to order it i think a lot i yeah. think uh, i think if you particularly if you bought things like jazz and stuff like that you had to order them actually jazz was what there was in abundance in this case there were loads of swing weird. loads of yeah. swing records like goodman shaw um, mm. there were not there were complete runs of some stuff and none of other stuff there were no Parlophone Race records yet there was a complete set of them Brunswick Sepia series oh, right. which right. was very odd to me was there more than one copy of many things you know how you said there was yeah there were yeah yeah 
Yeah. So there was quite a lot of duplication, right? Yeah, there was a, an I awful lot of duplication. Um, right. I think mm. um, you may have got the Muggsy Spania discs out of it. Um, ah, right, because right. there were three copies of all of those mm. and there were two or three of most of the Goodmans and you know the ones that they had uh, there weren't a lot of dance bands no so I mm. assume that they sold better Yeah, I've, I'll never know I suppose what no but I think they used to get delivered in uh in boxes of a certain... I know with 45s in the States, they used to be in count boxes of 25 of the... Um, so I'm guessing it was a similar... Like, sort of 20 or 25 in a, in one of those cartons. And I suppose if it was a... If it was a non-hit... Like, not... A, as long as it wasn't a huge hit, one shop would probably have a few boxes between one and three of those boxes. And then as soon as they started to dwindle a little bit, they'd think, oh, I'll order another box. And yeah. you ended you ended up getting what they just didn't happen to sell. Yeah, um, yeah. Because obviously, if, if they ordered a couple of boxes, and because they'd already had several boxes that had sold, and then they sold a box in a little bit, you'll have the two thirds of a box that just didn't go. Yeah, um, that's kind of what that would, on about the Davidsons. I guess they had to stop them because people bought them, schools bought them, yeah. country dancing, and all the rest of it. Was there more than one of those? as well yeah i think so yeah right right um perhaps you could perhaps you could order them in small and like obviously you could order whatever you wanted i think but perhaps you could also order them in lives and stuff like that yeah so maybe perhaps in the 50s when they weren't selling quite as well as they had in the 40s they thought well why don't we why don't we just order five instead of 25 in a box or something and they just yeah then that's why you did with three of each of things maybe yeah it was, it was very odd. I mean, I, I was just glad to have the opportunity to get anything in, in absolutely mint mm. condition at all, let alone that it was all swing. Mm. Um, and, you, and you reckon you, that like, even though it was, obviously, because it was just, like, overstocks, if you like, but nobody else had been there but picking through anything before you, you actually got don't think what, the total so. of what was left. There, might, mm. there may have been... I think it all stopped in about 56 or 7 mm. and there were absolutely no rock and roll records um, mm. so I, I mean there were no Bill Haley there were nothing like that um, mm. so it's mm. possible that somebody might have been and picked through um, but it was absolutely bizarre the other old stock experience I had was um, stuff from an army barracks mm -hmm. and they had been picked over because that was all in catalogue order and mm. we had everything and, and all of a sudden when you get on London you know all the Pat Boons are there but the Little Richards aren't um, right but that was mostly 40s and 50s stuff um, what right. I what I got out of there that I thought was really interesting was a lot of weird issues of country stuff um, ah right right so Hank Snow on HMV J.O. series and, and ah, weird right. things that. Um, mm. So do you reckon it because that, that's very much like national service era? Yes, think they were actually sold in a in a in a in a shop on. No, a, I think a, what, a what happened. Or... I think what happened. What I was told was the army had a copy of everything that came out, so that the officers and people could listen to it on the break. Right, and this was just their working collection. They were either absolutely mint, untouched, or they were knackered. So, that tells me that some of them were used. I think they had some mm. kind of filing system. I'd, yeah, mm. it would be interesting to know exactly what, how that worked. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd love to know if companies did things regionally, like, we'll send 200 Harry Davidsons to Yorkshire and 100 to London. Um, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I've always read that. So if anyone but that knows... army, but that army thing, um, I've seen, for example, comics and magazines with the the where, where because of the stamp on the cover, you know it's come from like an an army. Yeah, barracks. these are. They were actually 
they were actually sold on site. So I, I don't oh, know. Really? Your thing, your thing might have been more like a, a, um, their own ra- like their, their own sort of like radio slash entertainment thing, and that was their life. Yeah. But you could actually buy stuff on site. You could because you could. Oh buy. well, that makes a lot more sense. I didn't realise that. Mm. Um, that makes a lot more sense. So that'll be why there were three copies of things, and and some of them were one of them was knackered, the other two were perfect, because mm. someone bought two of them. Mm. Yeah, oh, that's it. Yeah, I didn't know that. They all came in covers that had like a flip over top, and they had some barracks station number. Um, right. on them. I think right. you might have had some off me. Um, uh. And then, funnily enough, Ian McPherson had a very similar experience and got a very similar collection from an mm. army barracks in Lincolnshire, and it was half the same stuff I'd had. Right, that's interesting. Yeah. I don't know how that, mm. but as I say, because the because, because you could, but basically this was like the comic and magazine equivalent of a tuck shop, if you like. It was yeah, on yeah. site, and you spent your own money on on those things. But yours seems to be a cross between that and like a a, a a library for the use on the like site the to entertain. Can, yeah. yeah, yeah, like a um, almost like a radio thing or an entertainment thing on site. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So to round up, then, have you got any Holy Grail records that you particularly? looking um, for that i'm actually looking for um i'm one of these where i've never really had a wants list and i think that probably stems from the fact that i've always bought on impulse um so with the exception of kind of sort of wanting to have more of some of the things i've already got like more blues or more jazz yeah. or what or more sort of a little bully and country things or whatever else um i'd quite like to have more cajun 78s than i've got because i've got quite a lot of cajun 45s but i've only got a few cajun 78s that's something i never got into you know mm. the, never, 50, never got the into early it. 50s ones the ones i've got on 78 yeah. i haven't got any of the early ones um that i can think of anyway i had a load um, of tapes of them from an american collector mm-hmm. who made tapes of, of Cajun 78s and I, I never I never got I, I like the hillbilly stuff mm, I find yeah, that yeah, yeah. very interesting and and that's another thing did you ever ever come across stuff like that collecting any any Jimmy Rogers stuff like that while you were uh, looking but, for records like in the wild yeah. occasionally you would I, I remember mm. I do remember finding a Jimmy Rogers on a green green labels on a phone yeah. and I and I found I'm trying to think what it was now uh, I did occasionally find things like a Carter family on a HMV you know those early 50s MH series type things or those J- oh, very rare, yeah, yeah and, and I, I did have a few things like that that turned up okay but these came with other oddball yeah. series things like Irish McCormack Pressings from the fifties, or oh, the you know, like I am. Yeah, I think they used they used to find like a few things together like that. Yeah. Um, hmm. um, but 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 there were certain styles of music, particularly country, that that uh, that didn't used to used to get like hmm. Carson Robinsons and things like that. Yeah, here's a shocker for you. Various different labels. This, this shocked me when I was old. It, my pal in uh, Scotland in Edinburgh. Uh, no, he's in Dundee. He's in Dundee. Um, I'm sure he'll correct me because he'll listen. Um, he says all the collections in Scotland are just overflowing with country stuff. Um, of the Panacord, Zonophone variety. Right. I had right. to tell him that I like that stuff because he's like, oh yeah, well, I'll, I'll have loads of it then. <laughs> um, apparently it turns up all the time there. So, oh, that's interesting because I, I was it? aware that c- country's always been big uh, and and, uh, and more re- a lot more recently than that in Ireland. I know that. Oh right. But I hadn't realised that it, had, it it was so big in Scotland, like a big thing in Scotland as well. At any time, mm. I didn't, hadn't no, realised that. I had no not idea. To, not it. not to any more of an extent that it would have where else. Anyway, um, yeah. I didn't think it was big in Scotland. Oh, that's interesting. So Cajun records are a thing that you're. 
Yeah, if, obviously a lot of the earlier ones cost a lot of money. And yeah. uh, the, the 50s ones in general can also be found on 45, so it's like... It's, but yeah. I've always I've always liked that music. I've always liked accordions. I love accordions. That's why I'm surprised mm. I don't like Cajun stuff. I have an accordion yeah. here. I can't play it for beans, but I have one. Right. Um, but but yeah, I've I've always been one of the without spending much money on them. I've always liked accordion band records. Yeah, me British, too. British records. Yeah, and you and you get them in in batches of different things. Um, What's the most you've ever paid yeah. for a seventy eight, and why? Um. I th- um, it's in the tens of pounds rather than yeah, hundreds. yeah. I've, yeah. I've, it's it's, de- it's I don't remember paying more than a hundred quid for a seventy-eight that I can think of, and mm. there probably are some of the scarcer sort of rock and roll things or blue. Like I've got a f- I've got quite a few, <clears throat> probably about ten or twelve um, trumpet label blues records. Elmore James, Sonny Boy Williamson. Willie Love, things like that. And quite a few of those were in the sort of 30 to 60... Bra- oh, Big Joe Williams ones uh, probably cost a bit more. Um, the Sparser Blues ones on that label. I've uh, paid out on yeah. a few XLO things and different labels like that. But the vast, the overwhelming majority of 78s that I own, regardless of style, cost me very little. Yeah, 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 um, me too. Um, I don't like um, paying money for things. I- I would, I would, I would say any of the earlier stuff that I bought that I've still got um, co- was in the three or six for a pound bracket. So it, yeah. it's and and then it, even the stuff that I buy now at record fairs that are really clean um, jazz stuff still a couple of quid downwards. Um, yeah. So yeah. it's all less lesser cost things. But, it's more uh, fun that way, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Basically. But then again, it. It, it it might be that like because I collect forty fives as well, and I do I do pay out on more of those, particularly if they're in like American rockabilly or roll things. On it, American it labels. Be, on on American labels, yeah. Um, it does. I I don't have them on seventy eight as well, so I kind of think yeah. that like seventy eights have never got into that sort of higher price brackets and I don't really collect LPs in a big way I do like LPs I have some but I've never had a huge number um, yeah. I tend to call me LP collection quite a lot and that's the same I mean there's a lot of very expensive LPs out there but I've never I've never been interested yeah. in buying them so. this is a whole other thing I, I, I genuinely feel for people who are now trying to start collecting vinyl on a budget because it's not going to happen you're no, just but, not going to find for, anything not for nice condition stuff anyway, particularly in, in vogue in any way, if it's collected yeah, by anyone else. Yeah, my dad's really into his classic rock stuff, and we used to go to car boots together, and, and I'd be looking for 78s, and he'd be looking for rock records. Mm. And he used mm. to come back with loads of stuff, Deep Purple, ACDC, that kind of stuff. And mm. he's that, forget it now. Just no way would you ever find that stuff for under a tenner. No, because even the more basic things that, that, that used to be w- virtually worthless, like Rumours by Fleetwood or mm. Bruce Springsteen stuff, they're, they're like 10 or £15 pound albums. Now. And then again, try finding a good copy of Rumours by Fleetwood Mac. Mm. Mm. I mean, mm. I, I like that album. Kelly likes that album as well. And, and I found... I have loads of copies of it. And it'd mm. never been nice. I, the nice one I found hilariously enough for fifty pin, fifty pence in a heart foundation shop. But I had no idea what they had. Um, mm. That was the same yeah, the... day that I bought a mono classical LP, seven ninety nine from Oxfam, mm. expecting to keep it on my shelves, and I then sold it for five hundred quid. So you um, actually got a bargain from Oxfam. Well, that's I know, I know, some kind of bargain <laughs> from Oxfam. <laughs> Yeah, 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 I know. And and you know what, I was stood there going, 10 99 bloody hell, that's expensive. <laughs> but I had no you idea. Because it makes you wonder where they got the price from. Because, like, it, yeah. it, it kind of, yeah, okay, it shouldn't have been 99p on their basis. But at the same time, why wasn't it taken out and sent to their, like, website? Or, you know, like, because they sell on Yeah, they, website, they must have just not it. checked it. They must have seen, well, it's not a... It's a classical record, so that's one black mark against it. It's not stereo, mm. and it's not on one of these big deal. It was it was a David Oystrak record on Columbia, 
Right. So they knew it yeah. was. They knew it. They knew there was something about it, yeah. but they'd rather sell it themselves in their shop than send it off anywhere. Who so knows? I think they missed it. I think they just completely missed it. Yeah, because I've been in Oxfam. I've been in Oxfam's, and they want seven ninety nine for Sound of Music. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and that's the thing. So vinyl obviously is later than seventies, and mm. I wonder if years ago there were records that were like the equivalent of the sound of music. Floral Dance by Dawson were probably one of them. It turned mm, up mm. everywhere you looked, left and right, there it was. Mm. And probably like probably like the, th- the things that uh, people got <clears throat> when 78s went out, like the, the things that people got rid of first, like Gracie Fields on Rex and just like the yeah. things that... That pe- people just yeah. um, they weren't that it was, I think newer 78s 50s ones as soon as people like as soon as the 60s came along people if especially if they were rock and roll people either kept kept them or traded them with people they still had a value they're still because they were recent but yeah I think yeah. kind of like your usual 20s and 30s things would have uh, and, and 40s stuff would have gone out uh, pretty quick. Glenn Miller and stuff yeah. like that, that that fluctuate as to whether they're in vogue or not um, would have turned up all the time in the in the seventy thought. Um, yeah, yeah. I remember someone was looking for Moonlight Serenade by Miller on Regal's on a phone, um, mm. and I thought, well, that's that's got to be common. And then I tried finding him a nice copy, <laughs> and suddenly it's a lot harder. Finding a nice, finding nice condition copies of records like that is very hard. Do you know what the hardest uh, one for me was? And we mentioned it earlier. Uh, Peggy Sue by Buddy Holly. That thing, if that isn't mm-hmm. perfect condition, it poof, poof, mm-hmm. it sounds awful mm-hmm. because of the way it's recorded. The drums on Peggy Sue distort, and the other side, the bass on Every Day distorts like Billio. And it took probably eight years looking for one to find a properly nice copy of it and there was a time when it was in every other shop yeah because that that was that like when you did used to find rock and roll 78s in charity shops and things that was one of them if if there was like four or five usual suspects that that was one of them Uh, but is it you never really saw his later ones than that very much or uh, his earlier ones blue days mm. black nights i've never seen that no, no, I've, I've, I've uh, I think I might have had that. I think I had that on a forty-five and sold it. Um, <laughs> but I've, that would have paid I've, a few I've, weeks' rent. Yes, that that that's uh, yeah, that was that was a good buy. But I've never, um, I'd, I've never had that on a seventy-eight. But having mm. the sound on, uh, the the sound on on that, that is fantastic. On yeah, a yeah, yeah, yeah. Them, them properly nice pressed Decker Brunswick's. And then again, you, you, another thing is, I know this is a complete side point, and we'll open it up soon because we've rambled on forever. Um, <laughs> ink spots, really uh-huh. common. However, try finding a nice one, and even if you do, I, I had some ink spots records from that old shop with mint, and they sounded atrocious. Yeah, they have a lot of surface noise on them, don't they? Yeah, yeah. wartime Brunswick's. Mm. I wonder what the American equivalent of those are. I suppose it's the, the lesser label jazz things, Commodores and whatnot, but noisy as. Yeah, yeah, because I, I, I've, when it, whenever you do get those Ink Spots or Mills Brothers, yes, Brunswick's from the like the forties kind of thing. Um, the, uh, it's because the music's quiet as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's, a spa, it's a sparse group of music. Well, it's usually it's just a guitar and voices, isn't it? Or yeah. piano, bass, and guitar and voices, and they're, they're quite quiet. <laughs> um, Whispering Grass is probably the best example of the one that has the, the heaviest surface noise on because yeah. it's so quiet. I've had um, copies of that and they've sounded awful. Mm, so it's uh, and uh, and there you hit the the fact the dilemma, which a lot of collectors I think will face. Um, which is the prevailing wisdom is you should only play records like that with modern stuff, but actually mm. they sound crap with modern stuff. And when you put a fiber needle in to mm. an acoustic sandbox, suddenly they sound a lot better. Mm. 
Yeah, yeah. Are you playing it on something closer to what it would have been played on in the first place? I wonder if in the 30s and 40s, here, Mm. they kept making records that were suitable for fibre needles and and steel needles, whereas in America, they stopped that much earlier on. Yeah, more more to do with, like, the... Like, they got sort of the the dance set style players sooner than we did, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, with with actual with actual styli in them rather than a, a, a larger needle. Yeah, yeah. yeah I maybe. remember reading something yeah. that said that you should only play. And it was written by an American, so I guess this is a, a U.S. centric advice. You yeah. should only play records pre nineteen thirty five with fast steel needles. And I just thought that's patent nonsense. I mean. Yeah, there must have been loads of people that bought, like, all kinds of different things. But you could imagine early 50s, uh, Hank Williams records were played on wind-up machines. They wouldn't do too well. <laughs> no, but they will have been played on wind-up machines yeah. with steel needles. It, it, yeah. Um, it, still. And, and, and I, I think in this country, um, not certainly in the early, early to mid-50s, people still mm. had... Um, even if they weren't wind-up machines, they, they, they used normal steel needles in, in sort of record yeah. players. If yeah, you I've like. seen stuff like that. Stephen had an HMV 101 that was made in 1954, um, which is incredibly late. Yeah, but having said that, I read something once where there was a small, it wasn't a record shop, but it was a shop that had a record counter, um, like a record department, and you had to, they just used to get a batch of things every week or every few weeks uh, coming in it was in a very small part of Scotland, and because not everybody had electricity, they had even up to about 1960. Oh, wow. They used wind wind up machines and used to buy like Neil Sedaka or whatever oh. on like a 1959 <laughs> PRCA and things like that. So, oh, yeah. Man. It, and they just got back. They got like a, ba- a batch of different records every few weeks into that shop, and you almost l- just looked through what was in that box, sort of thing. So there are instances of that. Wales was the same. A lot of the more rural parts of Wales um, didn't get um, electricity until a lot later than other places. Yeah, Kelly was saying that she thought rural parts of America had electricity in the forties, which mm. is mega. Mm mega interesting because I mean America's massive you know like places like I don't know Arizona or or somewhere really far south like Mm. (laughs) there's nothing and they had electricity and Wales didn't it's kind of bizarre yeah well it's I suppose it was just the the, the, the areas that were more sparsely populated obviously the towns had it but then again Mm. having said that in a lot of houses before about 1960, um, certainly in the sort of 40s ish and that, um, y- you would only have had a po- like electrical points in one room yeah. or in certain parts of a building. Yeah. You, you wouldn't have multiple points in every room. Um, so, yeah, there's that as well. Um, Somebody pointed out, um, I think it might have been Alan who pointed this out to me, that actually some early cylinder phonographs were electric. I, hadn't really, I, I didn't know that. Mm. So I just thought they were all wind up things. Yeah, yeah. Well, you would you would have thought so. Mm. At least but I that just so. that adds to the thing that early music technology was a, like a science, like a, a an yeah. extension of a science. You know, like you'd, people would have, if they were in science, they would have had the equipment to or the means to plug things in because they had other equipment that plugged in even yeah. quite early yeah. on. Um, but other than that, I don't think people. So it was that. a Tinkerer's hobby. I think that's, yeah. that's how I understand it. Really. Well, yeah. I mean, look at EMG and and things like that. They were very much bought by doctors, scientists, tinkerers. Mm. Your average Joe didn't have an EMG. No, because in the thirties you could buy a portable grammar for two or three quid. So yeah, they had to do that instead. I found it very interesting making and helping to make and prat about with. The one that I'm, you know, the, the sort of poor man's EMG that Alan and I are trying to make because the parts are out there to make something that is astonishingly good, much better than most portable grams. Mm. And anyone with the knowledge potentially could have 
done similar, and I just can't find record of them having it. Mm. Mm. You know, and, and you can scour the back pages, or at least I can, of, of 1920s and 30s gramophone magazine for hours, and you just don't see reference of this having gone on. No. Mm. So, 